I called and I told them like what had happened. I called the utility company and we were thinking like, you know, it's going to take forever for somebody to get out here. Then all of a sudden, about 20 minutes later, maybe 15 to 20 minutes later, I hear like chainsaw. I'm like, are they here? I said, I said to my wife, I'm like, are they here? She's like, there's no way. There's no way that they're here. So I go out there and bro, they are having a fun time. They've got these, these little mini chainsaws and they're just going through the jungle. I was like, oh, I know why they got here so fast. They're looking forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> they're looking forward they to were it. Having, they had a blast, man. And they're just, wah, 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 just, go, just flinging them around. And then <laughs> one guy's got the thing and he's like put, trying to push the thing. No, no, no. Chop it some more. He's like, all right. Just chop. An Orthodox priest monk that we all like. I was talking to him, and he said that uh, it was priest monk Cosmos said that um, when you push, if you're doing your job right, you're going to get pushed back, mm. especially if you're talking about salvation. He's like, you can mm. talk about icons, you can talk about the Mother of God, you can talk about confession, but really, salvation is when you start getting some pushback. Mm. Hi, with that, welcome to the Royal Path. I'm your host, Andrew. And um, uh, we lost Cyprian last week for a little bit, but that's okay. I yeah. never got to ask him, mm. Cyprian, if you were gulagged and they had to play an album on repeat for forever to torture you, what would it be? Oh, to, that's, that would be torture? It'd be torture. Um, there was this... There was this... Uh, band if you could even call them that I think they were called Crazy Town <laughs> well that's pretty bad I, I think they were called like Aqua or something like that and it was like early 2000s and they had this song Barbie, Barbie Girl, Girl. Yeah. Oh, yeah bro let me tell you I had the unfortunate experience of seeing them live it wasn't because I wanted to, but it was because in college I worked uh, in, in D.C. I worked security at this bar called the Bayou. And so I just I had to see whoever was there, but saw some interesting bands. I saw like Incubus, one of their first shows. Like I saw some in, which was a totally different band, by the way, like some really. For torture. Yeah. That would yeah. Be <laughs> I don't like that it. was it was a totally different band at that time it was actually a lot better but no but they had I remember one night and all the staff there was like oh I don't know how this is gonna turn out they had like the pop radio uh you know channel or whatever had one of those events and it was just like that band and like just some other terrible pop bands and I was like this is this is as bad as it gets so I think that would be it for me. That would be it. If they did that, I would, that would be, <laughs> now, now I've let them know. So I'm sure that that's what's in store for me. Uh, so... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. See, I think about these things. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh my gosh. So I feel like the ice is broken. Yes. Um, so we had talked about last week, we talked about salvation. Oh, Father, something happened. My, sorry. Yeah, oh my gosh. My wife just texted me. Oh, she's like, oh, Bane, why are you barking? And then this absolutely horrific picture of a gigantic possum out in front of the house. Oh, no, he's barking <laughs> I mean, at the possum. Golly, that thing is horrific looking. <laughs> <laughs> they're gross they're cool yeah. they're really gross <laughs> bunch of babies uh, hanging off its teeth 
<laughs> Gross. I dig Gross. possums. I like possums. I think possums are. Uh, cool. You wouldn't like know, this one, man. Yeah, yeah I don't. I don't know. They're not. They're. That's a freaky like, looking animal. That's a. That's a demon looking animal, actually. It's just riddled with disease. And... Yeah, they're gross. I feel like I'm. I'm just coursing through with Missouri blood. I just got Missouri blood. I feel like there's some possum in there somewhere. Like I. I feel like I just. I'm closely related with the possum. I just feel like Missouri folk are possum. When things go bad, we go run into the hills and hide in trees and stuff like that and rifle through and get garbage. We're survivors, we're scrappers. I don't know what to say. I feel like I feel like people in Missouri, like I feel like Ozark people are known for like eating possum. Yeah. Do they eat possum? Yeah, it's like um oh, fry? like a stew or something like a possum yeah, stew there's like a whole classification it's like squirrel possum coon um and mm. like beaver although beaver i think is a little bit higher class than that but it's like that it's like that trash meat um, trash meat's not the like, right word. like a roadkill oh um, <laughs> well <laughs> maybe in some parts of missouri but not not a civilized well folk. those are all rodents yeah and Riders. like it's critters not yeah, critter safe meat. to eat them you know because a lot of times they're riddled with parasites and stuff that's, like what, I'm just, that's what i was saying they're riddled with diseases yeah man. no it's, it's not good but i just feel like i feel like i walk through the night and i see a, a possum and we lock eyes we get it for a moment we get it it's like hey i i feel like just because i got that missouri in me man i just like i just have a little bit in and and like um we have something in common you know me and <laughs> possum but um okay enough about possums guys stop talking about possums we're going to talk about the nicene creed now so um okay so i believe in one god the father almighty maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible and in one lord jesus christ the son of god the only begotten begotten of the father before all ages light of light true god of true god begotten not made of one essence with the father by whom all things are made who for us men for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate of the holy spirit and the virgin mary and became man so um last week we had talked about salvation specifically and then this week this is interesting yes. um and i'm gonna really let you guys run with this um because you know i feel like i'm a little bit out of my league on this particular aspect of it um but uh, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became man. So this was kind of like, again, one of those moments, it's God's condescent, it's God's coming down to meeting us. It's God coming down to meet us. It's God, it's, it's God doing what God does, which is, you know, like he, we had the, um, the figures come beforehand. We had our Moseses, we had our Joshuas, you know, who were close, but didn't quite get it. And finally, God was like, all right, well, I'm just going to do it myself. And, you know, coming down. So that's kind of where I thought we would start. But then we were texting beforehand. And it seemed like there wanted to be an emphasis on the mother of God as well, which have to be have to have to we have to without a doubt that's our queen that's our queen we're talking about there you go so i think st i think starting it's interesting that you brought up the chronology because that's what's that's been an interesting exploration for me is that one of the unique things is that this is the first time that it's a woman in the chronology that has this this key this very key place it's very interesting but maybe father because you said you wanted to talk to talk about how how the mother of God slays demons, how our lady slays demons yeah. like crazy. <laughs> I, where I know we're going to get to that because that's the show. What a, can we talk about? Um, because for some, I, I think for some people watching who are not, I mean, Catholics will have no, no problem with this, but I think that this is a hang up for Protestants. Yeah. Um, is yeah. dealing dealing yeah. with Mary for sure is is a big hang up, and then you know I this coming into orthodoxy was my first experience with like her backstory with the proto evangelion of James and like learning about that that was that and that added a whole new twist onto it so maybe we could start out with just why she's chosen 
and the story of how how we get to that point and and who she, who she is and and what she represents i think maybe is a good starting point for the people who aren't who don't know yeah i mean i want to even maybe go even further back and i would even just um kick it off with something somewhat scandalous surprise surprise but um the whole reason why there's a nation of israel is for the mother of god mm. you know the nation of israel existing so the messiah could come yes the nation of israel existing because they were the people that were um, chosen pulled up set apart by god to be his people amongst all the nations who would worship him but understanding that that intention is to develop a, a so that a clean throne room would come so that a throne room he could incarnate he could find himself with a pure throne room in which he could come and understanding that like what that means it isn't just simply although god forbid we ever act or speak of our lady's holiness in such a way that it would you know um, denigrate it in, in such way i don't mean that at all but it's also the reality of god's plan of a people and not just simply our lady's incredible humility and her incredible courage but also the fact that she comes from a culture that could produce and facilitate a, a clean throne room and what i mean by that is you know her more more spacious than the heavens um as as many of the icons of her are, are called and her womb being that spacious throne room and a pure throne room she coming from a culture which would be um although not perfectly but you know the best out of any of the nations cleansed of idolatry cleansed of deviant sexual practice on a cultural level um cleansed of all those things that fundamentally defiled man and i think like we've talked about in regards of sin you know being manifested and sin being engendered in, in in locale right so i think i think it's important we talked about you know how the porn shop begets prostitution which begets drug use which begets abuse right it's like that i hate to use the term but that kind of inverted incarnation of sin and, and the the disease the contamination is a better word the contamination of sin well a woman who would be free of that not just in the, not just as an individual but she would come from a culture that would be free from that and so this is this is the backdrop in which the mother of god is 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 is, is her potential is made possible in this backdrop right in this backdrop of a people that would be freed um and and sanctified and set apart from all these wicked foul practices is that you, do you see what i'm saying yes yes and then so the you know this idea of her being then dedicated to the temple at an early age mm -hmm. um as is that then is is this it makes sense i mean as we talk about this this idea of the ark and then she's references the ark as well as she well is the ark, right? she's the ark she is the that ark. that then that's the i mean i hate to say it this way but like that's in some ways like the spiritual handoff is her being dedicated to the temple so therefore she becomes part of the temple matures in the temple mm -hmm. and then and so then she embodies the temple in that in that regard mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. correct and it, maybe not even handoff but it's the connection right by which um you know we're so influenced by like sci-fi and things like that but it's almost like you know this the the handoff the connection happens and then the the kind of locking of the pieces come into place and you see the fullness of the typology is now the reality right the 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 shadow and the foreshadowing is now you know caught up to the reality like that's that's what's happening so you're saying that it was always meant to be 
it was that it was always foreshadowing her, yeah. her womb the womb of the mother of god was always what the ark was foreshadowing was what burning noah's bush. ark was foreshadowing everything was foreshadowing yeah. yeah speaking of moses the burning bush right moses seeing you know christ yahweh in 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 the burning bush i am that i am but this this bush that is ever burning but never consumed this is our lady and so many of uh so much of our iconographic tradition is, is pointing to this reality you know, she's she's the song of the prophets, as we say in the church. The prophets sing of her. She's the the east gate, which you know the Lord shall shall pass through. No other man shall pass through out of Ezekiel. You know, she's the rock unhewn. I mean, just every prophet has spoken of her. Every everything points to her because she is the matrix by which Christ, the Messiah, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, God incarnate comes through. Um, and and that, that is what everyone needs to understand who isn't Catholic, you know, lower C. Everyone needs to understand that. And if, and if you have any um, background, you know, if you're evangelical, you know, Protestant or, or just nothing, but you're not sure, it's like you have to understand that on this very, you know, spiritual cosmic level of, of the profundity of, of that God contained himself within the womb of like a, you know, 15 year old girl, how old she was, you know, like it's, it's incredible. And again, just to kind of like put the period on, you know, that whole first part I was talking about um, the, the nation of Israel being set apart, that's what made, that's what facilitated and made possible her yes, right? Her yes is everything. The fact that she said yes, the fact that she in, in genuine authentic humility, you know, couldn't believe that the Lord would, would come to her, but she still said yes. But her being able to say yes in that way was made possible by the work of God. Setting, could she, could she have out. said no? This is something that I've talked about with people before. Could she have said no? She could have said no. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because it, it's, it's actually in her no, or excuse me, it's actually in the potential of her no that her yes is so profound. Yes. Like, I, yeah, I had a priest tell me one time, the priest that baptized me and said all of the Old Testament, all of it, all the blood, all the violence, everything was just to have a like a 14 year old Jewish girl say yes mm -hmm. and like willingly say yes and to be like, um, actually, you know, because yeah, I mean, God wouldn't force it. So, like, she, you know, I can't speak too much to this because I'm a, a little bit out of my league here. All I have really are emotions, but yeah, I mean, that was like, um, that was it. That was that's that's a great point right there because I mean that brings us to the point of her being the second Eve in the way that Christ is the new Adam, she's the new Eve. She's the one who redeems and does the complete, she is the repentance of Eve, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, in 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 the way that Eve facilitated and participated in the beguiling of her husband, you know, our lady she she lifts up and and i mean <laughs> she lifts up her son the second adam instead of beguiling him you know she um gives life instead of taking it away mm -hmm. right she provides you know the the humility instead of the you know the kind of the, to some degree the brazen impudence of eve mm -hmm. you know um you know the mother of god says whatever he says whatever he tells you to do do it she says this to the apostles right about about the lord right in the in the uh wedding of cana whereas you know eve is calling shots to adam you know what i mean like this is this is this is that distinction and just just so we don't get a bunch of people in uproar here um i'm not coming from some sort of chauvinistic bent on it because Although, yes, I just said, you know, she, she says whatever he says, you do it, but she's throwing commands at the apostles, right? So like, so let's yeah. not get it twisted, right? Totally. She's, she's 
she's fully aware. And, and, and another thing, I was just speaking about this with someone last week, it's like her silence in the scriptures is incredible because her silence is actually part of how the loudness in which she speaks in the church is, is that's the backdrop of it, of it, right? That's, she's that great surprise for those who come into relationship, deep relationship with the kingdom of God and his king, right? Because we have a king and the king has a kingdom and in that kingdom, there's also a court and in that court is his mother and all, and all of that is real. And every king and every court that has ever existed is at best a poor shadow, if not unfortunately a mockery. But the reality is, is like we, the only reason why we understand this concept of a king and a queen and a hierarchy and all that stuff is because it exists in heaven. This is, this is the pattern that God has established. It's not the other way around, right? We didn't create these ideas and project them on some sort of, you know, um, fictitious, you know, quote unquote heavenly hierarchy. It's the other way around. This is the, we got the echo of the reality, you know? And she also like to that thing that you were going to say a second ago, father, about um, her saying, whatever he says, do it. Like there's accounts. Um, and I'm thinking of one specifically, and I don't think it's necessary to regale the entire account because it's from elder Ephraim of Arizona. Um, uh, where a woman was basically in the court uh, and Christ is saying like, there's nothing I can do. Mm -hmm. And she's like, no, 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 no. You're all powerful. You are all wise. You can figure out what to do. Like, I know, like, I know what a relationship with a mom could be. Mm -hmm. Like, I know what it could be with a perfect mom, with a mom like that, that is like able to say like, no, I know my son. I know what he can do. You can do this, mm -hmm. do it. Like, you know, like there's times in the Bible and father, please correct me if I'm wrong. Cause I could be where he's like, she grabs his ear a little bit and she's like, Hey, 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 no, 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 no. You need to go do that. And he's like, uh, yes, thank you. And then like goes off. Well, it's not really in scripture. That's like apocryphal counts of things. But I think, I think to be clear, there's this wonderful icon, um, where if I was, if I remember it correctly, it's either in the icon now or at one point in time. It, at any rate, the, in, in part of this icon, to, to we couldn't look it up. It's um, the- Cyprian John. I mean, basically the mother of God is, um, I'm trying try to remember. It's, oh man, someone's gonna crack around this one. But if I'm not mistaken, what, well, what it was was someone was, um, I can't remember if it's, if it's her, putting her hand over his mouth or he's putting his hand over her mouth because someone was like, please have mercy on me. And he, and he was just, he was not wanting to move on the situation. And she, she, this person asked the mother of God and she was beginning to just say, you can do this, you know? Mm -hmm. And he's like, no. <laughs> and he like puts his finger <laughs> over her mouth uh, to kind of like shush her because he, he didn't want to, um, he, he, he basically didn't want to kind of, you know, let this, let this whatever situation pass. I'm, over. I'm looking now to try to find this icon. Yeah, if I can remember the name of it. Um, but I mean, it's, it's incredible. And, you know, there's, there's these other accounts. I mean, it's, there's these sayings that you'll hear about, you know, go to, go to his mother because he can't refuse his mother, you mm. know? Um, and it's, it's, it's true, you know, it's true. Um, I, I think that's one of the things too that I think more than the kind of inherited Lutheran distaste, and I don't mean necessarily Lutheran like the domination, but like, you know, Luther and like his hangups and all the stuff in regards of the mother of God. But I think one of the problems people have honestly is that it's kind of scary to, to think, it, it gets scary for people to, to entertain this idea that Jesus isn't the, um, 
the pliable pushover Pillsbury dough, Pillsbury dough God that people want him to be, where it's just like, yeah, like it's all good. Don't worry about it. Because when we, we get into these accounts of the mother of God interceding on our behalf, the other half of that, which is so incredible, is that she's interceding with her son who is going to do lots know, of punishment. Who can be austere. Yeah. Who can be austere. You know, um, St. Sophroni is an iconographer. We talk about him a lot. Greatest theologian of the modern, of the modern age. He should have been the fourth theologian for, from my perspective, but that's okay. So anyways, um, he he would often he would talk about how um, modern man can't handle um, an austere Christ like the ancients could, like a Byzantine icon of Christ, because um, you know, not because that was wrong and not, and not because that didn't actually portray Christ in, in his personality. Because when you, if you read the scriptures, anyone who's read the scriptures honestly, you can see that in him. You can see oh, him. Oh, oh, yeah. You're like, I oh, mean, this is this guy's difficult. He's a, this yeah. is a difficult, yeah. hard driving. Like, yeah. it's the kind of teacher that I like. Yeah. You know, yeah. like for me yeah. personally, yeah. I it's the type of teacher I need where it's like yeah. there's love, but there's an incredible strictness, and also doesn't put up with any of your BS. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, let's let's put it this way: the whole the great sin of, you know, the soft bigotry of low expectations. That's not Christ. You know what I mean? Christ, Christ knows what you're fully capable of but in both ways. He knows how, how capable of wickedness you are, but he also knows how capable of, of holiness and love. I mean, and he holds this to account, right? That's, that's Christ, right? So anyways, St. Sophroni, he's like, yeah, people can't handle it. And again, not because that's not Christ, but because of how weak we are, right? That people need to have this. And I, and I get it. I get it. It's one of the reasons why I don't, you know, when I ever paint an icon, unless someone actually asks for it, you know, I, tr I don't make a super austere um, expression because it, it is tough for modern people. We're too weak in that sense. Nevertheless, um, that endearing soft mother who is the greatest intercessor you know, of all, of all the saints. Um, the other side of that is that the one she, the one in which she's um, asking intercessions of is her son who is austere, <laughs> you know? So, so I think people struggle with that. I think when they, when they hear these things, and again, it's more than just like, well, I don't see that in the scriptures, this and that, because people who go down that road of, I don't see the scriptures, there's lots of things that they do that aren't in the scriptures. In fact, their whole Christian experience, I really don't see in the scriptures, to be frank, right? So, they, so that's not sufficient enough. I think on a deep psychological primarily, but to some degree spiritual level, they really struggle with this idea that like, wow, what if, just like, just what if Christ is maybe not as quote unquote nice as I was told he was or want him to be. You know, it's getting us back to that onion video, right? It's like, who, who do you think you're approaching? And, and this is one of the reasons why I think for some people, it's so easy to, unfortunately, to not, to not enter into deep prayer because they don't have reverence. Because the God that they're praying to is more like Prince Valiant than, <laughs> than the, than the, than the creator of all things who just staring upon him will undo you to, to your, to your very fiber, you know, of your being. I can we it. talk about, can we talk about intercession a little bit? Because th this is like, of course, if we're talking about the mother of God that, and, and you brought up intercession, this is a, also something that Protestants have a real, real difficult time with this idea of intercession. I read something, it was just the other day. So it's, it's, it's point, it's like topical now, but uh, something that uh, Bishop Callista Ware had said, where he was talking about, and I didn't, I, this is the first time I had heard this. He said in private prayer, uh, Orthodox can ask any other Orthodox to intercede on their behalf. So he said, like an orphan child in his private prayers 
might ask his parents uh you know who who are, have have died he, he might ask them to intercede on his behalf mm -hmm. um and that that would be something that that could be done but clearly there's levels of of intercession mm -hmm. and i think that as we're talking about the holiness of God, this became very clear to me and it was one of the reasons why i came to you and said i need to be in the church mm -hmm. because my own experience you know i I, I have enough of a spiritual background to where I could start to get close. Like I was like, I recognize this. I feel this. I could start to get close. I understand what this is. And it was, it was like being burned. Like it, it, it really was without the framework. And then something that has been very com comfortable for me as people who will know my background could probably guess is that approaching the divine feminine is not, is for me feels very comfortable. Mm -hmm. Um, on both sides of it, right? Mm -hmm. So both the blessed mother, you know, and the devouring mother, I've, I've been able to approach both in my life, right? And I will not go to the left, to the left side at this point in my life, but um, just how, how do we, cause this, this aspect exists in, in like many other traditions, small T mm -hmm. um, of the divine feminine offset with the divine masculine but it's different mm -hmm. in in our tradition because she's interceding to mm -hmm. something that's bigger even than the, i guess the logos might be the masculine but then inter interceding even to the larger mm -hmm. entire trinity so can we talk a little bit about like the the process of intercession yeah. and then can we talk about why she is the intercessor yeah the, the, I mean, the greatest i i mean i i think the thing is is that um, well, she's the greatest because she's most pure. She's the mother of God. She said yes. She is authentically humble. She suffered um, unlike anyone was able to suffer in regards of giving birth to life itself and, and being aware of the absolute crushing wickedness of reality of a fallen world, which would slay its its author slay its sire right that i mean to to be aware of that to ponder these things in your heart you know it says in luke of how you know she she meditated all these things and pondered, and pondered all these things in her heart uh, think, speaking about you know the incarnation and, and what was to come i mean we can't even really imagine what kind of insights into reality she had um but i we can assume they're they're pretty profound there's this really interesting there's um an akathist those of you who don't know what an akathist is an akathist is a a prayer service in the orthodox church um which akathist means just without sitting um but it, it's a prayer service that's done which is um hymnography um prayers um put together in honor of a saint of christ of an event in the life of christ the mother of god things like that um there's one called the softening of the hearts and uh, maybe cyprian you could pull up that icon that would be great um yeah absolutely but the softening of evil hearts um in our parish here we have a we have uh a fairly strong local devotion um, to Our Lady in this icon. Um, this icon in particular, I can tell you, has gotten me and this community like through some pretty tough battles uh, with some things. And um, it's, it's, it's an incredible, incredible icon. It's an incredible akathist. And the thing that's striking about this akathist is when you pray it, the title, can be misleading for someone if, you, if you're kind of approaching it at just from one simple perspective. Because as you go through the, the act of this and you're praying it, you're just, you're kind of struck at like, well, this is just kind of like history. This is just kind of like laying out the things that she's encountered. But then as, you, as you've prayed it, and I've been praying it for years now, um, it starts unfolding things and you, you start realizing like, Lord have mercy, I, I'm seeing, I, I'm 
yeah, I'm, I'm beginning to see um, the world and fallenness of the world through, through her eyes, you know, and how it was. And so, um, so we have here these, um, these seven swords, which is, you know, representing the, the prophecies of, of Simeon and St. Simeon of how the ways that um, his death and his resurrection, his betrayal um, would, um, you know, wound Our Lady. Um, and so this icon from, from my perspective is one of the great examples of why she's such an incredible intercessor is that um, her sorrow and her suffering um, come together in such a way that she's never embittered. She's never twisted. Her, her perception, her vision is never distorted. She's made all the more pure by the pain and the suffering. Whereas for us, the pain and the suffering distorts us, it twists us, it, it turns us into villains, yeah? But for her, it purified her, it made her all the more brighter, it made her all the more loving, it made her worthy of, of, of every veneration and honor afforded to her. So um, this, is, this is a key aspect, I think, of why she's such a great intercessor. Um, if, Mother, yes. May I ask really quick, um, why, what's the difference there? What's the difference? Why does it soften her heart and why does it harden the heart of other people like that suffering? Like well, just on like, I guess, a base emotional and spiritual level. Sure, because in the same way that she fully had Christ in her, right? That's why it, it softened her and didn't harden her because of her connection to life. And th this is important because when we therefore have Christ in us, in a way analogous to her, our hearts will also be softened when we suffer and not harden. The heart that hardens through suffering is the heart that does not wow. have Christ. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's, you know, that's, it's really interesting because I think this was one of the concepts. I think it was perhaps, as I understand it, Father, maybe the, the maybe kind of what might have put, put potentially been something that was like, on your radar at a certain time it's and and this connection through the divine feminine but this idea of how the inversion of that is the devouring mother and how we see that mm -hmm. how how we've i've been talking about the rise of the devouring mother as like and not even having the background of the theotokos to, to be the the counterpoint but always understanding that of, of course if you're going to talk about the counterpoint of the blessed mother she uh, uh, there's no in the in the course of humanity there's no greater represent she is the ultimate representation and i think everybody knows that mm -hmm. like of, of all traditions all faiths there's no, if you're like who's the representation of the the blessed mother they're right. like I mean, oh, even, well, muslims, Mary. Right? Even, even muslims even muslims who deny the christ they they honor her right yeah exactly <laughs> exactly and the but this this is so interesting what you said there that the suffering softening the heart of a, a christian mm -hmm. right. but hardening the heart of someone who has the inverse mm -hmm. and it's so it, it's so clear like right now mm -hmm. this is what's going on that it's like suffering and then let me lash out let me find a scapegoat let me find a target let me find something Correct. hey Correct. cyprian i'm yeah. really sorry what is the devouring mother? Ah, yes. So this Which, is by the, the way, forgive me, Cyprian. Go ahead. I, I hate to do it because I, I, I want to say this to you the other day. Go, oh, please. <laughs> I think this is one of those great examples where if we can post whatever, I think you should link if you still have it. Yeah. Like you need to link your talk on the devouring mother in there. I think people should have it. And, okay. Because you got... Forgive me, everybody, for plugging, but Cyprian's got some incredible stuff that he's done, and just I think people should have access to it. So definitely link that in the you know whatever. I will. I think the I think probably the the best talk I had was with Matt Asher 
like it was very very good and, and like quite quite detailed so the devouring mother is i mean it's this ancient notion but i think like in the modern times probably probably Jung was the mm -hmm. the best in terms of articulating it but it's super ancient but this idea that every archetype has a positive and a negative and i mean this even in the christian i mean it's kind of like christ and antichrist this idea but that when you're talking about the divine feminine and the divine masculine that you can see these patterns of so with the masculine it's easy right and and you see this in like mythology narrative comic books novels that there's the wise king and the tyrant right and sometimes they can even be like the same person um that one can turn into the other right but it's like wise king and tyrant and then on the the feminine the divine feminine it's the blessed mother and the devouring mother and the idea of the devouring mother that's specifically interesting like in terms of her being devouring so like kali the the goddess kali, kali. she's here i'll i'll pull i'll pull, pull her up she is um or like lucille blues from arrested who's lucille blues from arrested development oh okay. a terrible terrible mother who instills guilt and fear in all of her children so they can't yes yes that is it it is about what what she does to the children is about guilt and fear that's that's a key and like that's the that's the devouring aspect of her here i think i found a good one of kali yes okay so one of the things that in looking at this we have the mother of god in the west but we don't have the devouring mother like they do in the east so we're we're totally we have no immune system for it we have no immune system against it right so like kali is like absolutely the archetype of the devouring she's got like human bones all around and everything she's stepping on krishna no that that's shiva i think she's yeah. stepping on she's stepping on shiva but the interesting thing about it is like shiva's letting her step on that's the that's the whole thing is that he like ah and so there's there's no th but this is the um so basically what what we what we're seeing and i mean if you look around like it's the culture the devouring mother is so much of like what wokeness is overprotective overbearing right and this is the whole idea of why she's stepping on shiva like for you your think safety. That she, what's that for your, for your safety, safety. For your safety, exactly. It's for your safety, mommy dearest. For your safety, and, yes. It's every watch. It's every Roger Waters Pink Floyd album. After like a certain period, it's like everything's about his mm. mom. It's like I'm gonna keep you safe and warm, even if it sucks the life out of you. You know. And um, Jordan Peterson has referenced this, and I don't know who he was referencing, but he's called it um, psychological incest. Mm -hmm. Psycho, because he says that what the mother is getting out of it and we see that like writ large in the archetype is that what the mother is getting out of it is a is turning this the son into a lover basically as opposed to remaining like as opposed to pushing him out into the world it's keeping him here with her mm -hmm. and it's like lockdowns mm -hmm. <laughs> that's it mm -hmm. <laughs> i mean that's the whole thing like no don't leave never leave never leave me the ever suffering mother right like never leave me have the guilt that oh what would i do if you ever left all of this right mm -hmm. so that's the we can, we understand like the wise king and the tyrant and how to fight against the tyrant because it's like yeah you stand up and you like punch the guy in the face but if you try to punch the devouring mother in the face it gets the exact opposite because her whole game is to be a victim. Mm -hmm. So now you've empowered her by punching her in the face. And that's, and so there's so much of even like the resistance to the, to the wokes, you see how it just backfires. Every, the, look, January 6th, mm -hmm. the, the, the insurrection, whatever you want to call it, look at how that backfired. You know, and it's like, and who's in charge of that? Who got on the floor and was like, the temple of democracy has, been, I mean, we've Nancy Pelosi, right? She's, I mean, she's the archetype of the devouring mother. 
so it's just like everything right now is devouring mother and we can't we have no cultural framework for seeing it in the west right but what's useful is if we have if we have the mother of god then we at least know like well this is not what she would do right this is not from her right wow yeah that's like the exact opposite mm -hmm. she's like sitting there and she's like i will suck yeah i see that Mm -hmm. I, will, I will suffer through and let this happen to this man because it needs to happen rather than yeah see that's exactly it right there that, that's exactly it because the divine mother in this and this as Cyprian was explaining it will not tolerate suffering hmm. and in her refusal to tolerate suffering suffering is compounded and made all the worse and she actually is a poor mother because she devours that that's her remember one who devours is one who's insatiable one who's not able to be satisfied right she's devouring right she's devouring her young so this this understanding of not being able to tolerate suffering it actually makes the suffering of her children quote unquote so much worse but the mother of god like a good parent does she's she understands well this is hurting me. This is, it's, um, I mean, it's incredible pain. All these things are, it softens her heart, but nevertheless, she's not weak. Mm -hmm. See, and there, and there is the play of strength, right? Because the mother of God is strong, right? But she's not ferocious in a, in a feral way, right? She's strong, but she doesn't, she's, she's also truly selfless. And she's also truly willing to allow the greater good to come to come forward. This is why she doesn't stop her son, right? Because what happens when someone tries to stop Christ? What happens? Do you know? Like, remember, think about Peter, right? Oh, sure. Peter says, no, Lord, you know, you'll never, you know, never let you go to the cross. Get behind me, Satan. You care for the things of man, not for the things of God, right? The mother of God fully understood the, the absolute necessity of the suffering of her son, but was never hardened to it. You, you, you see what I mean? Mm. This, is, this, is, this is the big difference. And she was willing thing, to endure. She, wouldn't, she would endure it because that was, that was the righteous thing to do. She's, she, that's the righteous thing to do. She is, the, she is the, the, the great archetype of motherhood and parenthood, in fact, right? Because we fail as parents on a biological earthly level because of our weakness. How many times do we struggle with having to let our kids go through the hard things they need to go through? Yeah, all right? the time. All, all the, time. the time. It's not because of them. We say it's because we love them. It's not. It's because we're weak. It's because we don't want to endure the pain that we're going through seeing them suffer. But it's like, that's a lack of love on our behalf. It's like that thing that you're talking about the other week where it's like we want to eradicate homelessness and, you know, uh, hunger because we don't like looking at it. Right. Like right. that suffering may be for the betterment of that person, but That's rather right. we would, we just don't like looking at it. That's right. We'd rather like yeah, that people say, I can't bear to see my children in pain. Right. right. And it's like, well, right. that's not, right. which actually, which... as I think about it right now, that's, you're so weak then. And that's terrible for your children. <laughs> it, it's absolutely terrible. And I would say, I know we don't want to get too much on a, on a rabbit trail with it, but like, what the heck? I mean, that's the big thing about the devouring mother now. And this inability to see people not suffer. Like, look, no matter how you want to cut it up, although everyone here is pretty much going to know how we feel about the virus and all that stuff. Let's just say, right, just just for sake of argument, let's just say everything was as they said it was, which only a fool believes it now. <laughs> I mean, forgive me, right? But let's just say everything was as they said it was, we still would have been better off living our life like we had for the last however many centuries up until sure. two years ago, right? Because just from the lowest level of all the measures that we did, are actually gonna make people sicker. Keeping people out of harm's way is actually making things worse, right? That's not even getting into the way it's affected them psychologically, spiritually. I mean, all these things that have happened, right? If we were just able to say like, hey, you know what? We'll do our best, but these things happen. 
with just like we did in all of memory, except for the last two years, right? Like that inability to suffer. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? That inability to say like, yeah, this is gonna be rough, but like we gotta carry on. You know what I mean? Like let's let's carry on, right? That inability. I mean, we would have been better in every way, Father. In every single you way. You know, like I'm not even forget about the somebody says, oh, maybe more people would have died, and it's like, well, we don't know that for sure, but but he, like perhaps perhaps more people would have died perhaps i don't think so but part of people dying is going to be how like cohesive the society is mm -hmm. and what i saw being pushed <laughs> and is still being pushed to this day is literally social distancing mm -hmm. that's the exact opposite of a cohesive society that's right and and that's the exact opposite of caring for your neighbor which is what mm -hmm. keeps somebody alive that's right. <laughs> right it wasn't all hands on deck. Okay, we're gonna fend for the for the sick. If you're sick and then you've recovered, now you get to go into the front lines of this thing because you recovered from it. So now you can't catch it, and we'll just we'll line it up like that, and we'll just beat it that way, you know. And oh, children are children are fine. So let's get the children out there doing their thing. Like let's you know because they're gonna be okay. And we were we knew that, but it's just the the setup, and we even see it right now. We see it that it's like. Everybody's like, oh, there's a, another wave, another wave. It's extremely mild, extremely mild, extremely mild. And they're like, lock it down. Right. If we lock it down. And it's like, wait a minute. <laughs> wait, wait a minute. It's going to be a winter of death and destruction, like coming from the president of the United States. And it's, they're in South Africa, like, uh, no, we just went through it. And like, it's very mild, y'all. Like, it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> It's death and destruction. It's coming this winter. And it's like, yo, man. <laughs> but that's the devouring mother. That's so, right there. Mother. That's the devouring mother. Again, without getting too much on a rabbit trail um, or going too far down this, because I, I do think we should get back to singing the praises of the mother of God in just one minute. But um, it was pointed out to me that... Um, <sighs> So uh, there's a fantastic resource page. I'm going to plug it really, really quick for people who are um, like me, who often have feelings and inclinations about things, but have a really hard time putting words to it, have a really, really hard time being able to like vocalize what's happening. I'm like, so what's it like, but you don't see how it, so like, there's a really great uh, resource for that. And that's the, again, Priest Monk Cosmos's page on the vaccine uh, or the little devils the um that uh basically draws out a bunch of this kind of stuff and i would be remiss if i didn't at least mention it seeing as how right now it seems to be coming in waves and we're right in the middle of one of those waves of apparently everyone i know and love is just going to be dead within like a week and we're going to overburden the already extremely overtaxed hospitals that like the you know whatever blah 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 but um, one of the things that uh, we hadn't talked about, and I, again, get back to the praises of the mother of God in just one minute, was this whole canon that's being thrown around um, about uh, St. Nicodemus, mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah. about the, if you are to um, knowingly spread the plague, you should be penanced as a murderer. Um, and this is something that's been thrown around a lot, around a lot, around a lot by um, various people, blah, blah, blah. Doesn't matter. We don't need to name names. Um, and uh, I was talking, uh, I, I was reading about it the other night and that argument kind of came into place where it was like, okay, well, that is, um, that, man, it's late. Um, that is taken out of context in the sense that like uh people have been throwing that around but really the larger context behind that is because if that were the case then every orthodox christian who accidentally spread the flu to an elderly person should be penanced as a murderer and like that's not that's not the case like that's not what's happening the larger context within that and again read this this is what i'm talking about all of this stuff is addressed I dare not try to approach it and try to actually explain what, what this means. This is outside of my realm. I'm not smart enough. I'm not eloquent enough. We're going to have to link it now because you, 
You've that's that's what the what the oh, it's as it's as good as linked. It's as good yeah, as linked. It'll yep. be linked. So I yeah, like I said, I dare not try and actually throw my two cents in about what this is. But this thing for the people who are in the know, who have struggled with this question, struggled with this cannon being thrown around, there's literally just a page just chopped full of resources about like these are the claims of what's being said and this is why it's not okay and then this is how this links and this is how this doesn't work and kind of even using some logical arguments and blah 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 approaching things from the spiritual perspective so i would be remiss if i didn't at least mention that at this point just because it's such a fantastic it's so good to have a person who um is able to explain things well and have it be able to come back and be referenced. So great resource. Well, there's also, you know, there's the we've talked about life and death and spiritual, the the idea of life spiritually and, and spiritual death. It's like, how are you penanced if you spread the kingdom of the Antichrist? Mm-hmm. Right. Like how how are you how how should you be penanced if you if your actions contribute to the spiritual death of people? Then how should you be penance? If you convince somebody that it's a good idea for them to take the mark of the beast, for instance, mm-hmm. how would how would the propagandist for the mark of the beast be penanced? I think there's an important question there, right? Like, yeah, it's, it's interesting. I mean, it's honestly it's interesting because one of the things that um, we're facing right now is these hard lines where, I mean, I've never. I've, I've never experienced anything like this in my lifetime. And I think that's the big kicker is most people agree. And no one can think of a time in recent history where we, the world at one time has experienced such hard line on things, you know? And the, the church is faced with this real conundrum right now of not just this issue of just such hard lines being drawn, but at the same time, not being seen if that makes sense what I'm saying, right? It isn't just simply black hat, white hat, whatever. But at the same time, it's like, like if you you bring something up, like these issues, it becomes super problematic for people because there's still some people who may or may not see, but if they do see, they could be on on some level of a spectrum where they find, maybe they could say on one hand, things haven't gotten bad enough to warrant such strong language, you know, um, which I don't know how, you, <laughs> I mean, I don't, know, I don't know what you're waiting for, but on the other hand, they could say things haven't, be, things are not conclusive enough to really warrant strong language. Either, either way you want to look at it. And, and I think the reason why I'm going there with this is because like at what point in time are you negligent for not warning someone of something? Exactly. Like, mm-hmm. You know what I mean? At what point in time? And I think this is the thing because we can default and be like, well, everyone's conscience. And I'm, I'm all for that. I, I'm all for that. But, you know, I, I think um, someone and someone, I just read something somewhere. I think it might've been in one of the like gajillion threads I'm a part of. Someone was talking about how, um, there's these head. Oh, you know what? I think it's in that new Paul King's North article. I think. Um, I think. Yeah, I was reading it this morning. He's doing that series on the virus, whatever you know, and um, excellent stuff. And he was talking about some headline that didn't age well from like last year. It was like, you know, anti-vaxxers, you know, warning of conspiracy against you know, uh, COVID passports, like. Like that was just the most absurd thing. And then here, here we about are, to get like, <laughs> right? About so, to get like Ministry of Information to out. Yeah, like yeah. So, find that article anymore. So it's like, it's, it's like those things have happened so quickly. You know what I mean? It's, it's happened so quickly. And it's like, you start saying to yourself, well, if this happened this quickly, I, I'm just thinking about the whole, giving birth um, kind of timing or phenomena, you know, it's like the, the birth pains, you know, they grow more intense and more rapid in between. It's like 
a lot of us were thinking, most of us who are where we're at now, at some point in time, last year were like, they're just, yeah, they're gonna make these things happen, right? Mm-hmm. A lot of us didn't think it would be here this quick. Like we like, you know what I mean? Like, oh, I mean, it's it's like whiplash quick, right? My timeline's way off. My like predicted timeline, I've been wrong about a lot of stuff, but yeah. You know, so so the thing is, is this is like this puts this idea of well, when do you start actually saying something? Right? When when do you become complicit with something simply because you're scared of not of mentioning something or simply because you're scared of attention in a conflict that isn't being drummed up for the sake of being contentious right but actual but out of actual care you know it's like it but that's the good. measure though isn't it father that if if you're not doing it because you're scared i mean doesn't this go exactly to what we're talking about if you're like if you say well why am i not doing this and it's like well in my heart, I'm actually scared. I'm scared of the consequences for me, let's say, if I'm wrong, mm-hmm. right? That it's like, even if you were to couch it in like, look, I could be wrong about this, mm-hmm. but this is what I really feel is about to happen. But you're like, I'm not even going to say that because there would be repercussions for me. Mm-hmm. Like, <laughs> for me, that's the metric. If I reach that point, then it's like, oh, this is exactly what I need to say right now. <laughs> like, right. This is right. exactly this is exactly what I need to say because if I'm actually worried about repercussions, then this is serious. Right, right. No, it's right. Because no, because nobody's no nobody's worried about the things that are really out there. You know, the 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 weird UFO people talking about ra- being visited by ray aliens and these sorts of things. I mean, not demons, but like the people who are making stuff up. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. the conspiracy theorists where you're like, these things are made up. Mm-hmm. Nobody's scared to share those things. There's no repercussions. Right. Right. So it's like, if you're worried about repercussions, if There's you're scared truth. about truth repercussions, that's the truth. <laughs> what you have is the truth. <laughs> if what you're worried about is repercussions <laughs> and you're scared, you've yeah. got the truth. You need to say yeah. it. This is, this is my thought on it. That's, yeah, that's, yeah. that's my yeah. message. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, so yeah, I mean, God help us, you know, and, and this is this is the thing kind of circling it back to the mother of God. It's like there's a there's a courage that for me, I just. I don't know, I can't always help but think of courage when I think of her. Yeah. And there's there's just a real courage that we must have. I mean, that's to me, that's one of the great. Tragedies, great conspiracies great like just bad stuff that's happened in regards of christians have become synonymous with being craven with being spineless with being this just mush you know and that's not christianity that's not the mother of god there's there's a courage that that's there you know yeah and i i I wanted to ask really quick to be able to bridge this world if like um as far as when to say something as far as when do we actually need to say something to someone i guess i worry a little bit about acting like peter of like running up and being like rah and then like slicing someone's ear off and then i'm like i did it and then, like turning back to god me like ah 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 mm-hmm. is that good did i do a good thing did i do a good thing i just went up and ripped somebody's mask off and I was like, or I like, like yelled at them outside of Costco, or whatever, blah, blah, blah. I haven't. Yeah, but see, that's before. not that though. See, and, and, and again, real path, right? That's not that. But sure. Let's just clear, right? But, I think the best way to understand it is it's Ezekiel and it's the watchman. And the Lord says, look, if you warn them of what's coming, then their blood is on their heads. If you don't warn them, then I will require their blood at your hand. That's that's what's said in Ezekiel. That's the standard mm-hmm. that I think we can look at it from. And so the inference there, what's inferred there is that it's not a kind of uh, boisterous, um arrogant bravado of like you're wrong like it has nothing to do with that it, it 
I think the context, even the way Super is talking about it, is just kind of like, look, you know, it's like, if you're even thinking about how tough something is, but it's like, you want to say something, it's like, you say something out of love because it's like, for me not to say something is actually me not loving you. For me not to say something is actually me being more scared of me being uncomfortable or me suffering some repercussion versus like sharing with you the truth. That's not the same thing as, um, which you're correct, Andrew, we should never fall into that kind of arrogance and that um, self, um, self-promoting self kind of bravado, right? But I think, at least for me, that's not, that's, I think those are two separate things because right now what we're, t- listen, what we're talking about is something as simple as this, um, we're getting to a point where, you know, people are, are going to suffer real repercussions um, on a lot of levels, spiritually. Camps, camps. Yeah. Next next I mean, month in New York, they're voting on the camps. It's, I mean... In New York, they've, it's it's there. For, forced pokes and, and non-poked in camps. In New York State, they're voting on it on the, on the 6th of January. So I mean, the bills are in. Would it be okay for me to walk around with my the end is nigh sign? Could I do that? Is that like a good way of warning people? I mean, I'm just saying the end is nigh. But it's meta true. That's that's always true. You could always walk around with that sign and it would always be true. Oh, I'm always right. Yeah. I'm just saying like that's <laughs> that's a win win for me. I mean, I get to both emulate Rorschach from the Watchmen spoiler. <laughs> And be able to walk around and have what is have you ever seen 28 days later? Yeah. Classic. The, Absolutely. There's classic a explicit classic. in there, but I've written on the side of the church, the end is extremely yeah. nigh. Like, yeah. man, ah, that's so cool. Like I would absolutely rock that on a shirt any day of the week, as long as I wasn't around my kids. Well, I think that gets to something though. I think that gets to it that, that gets to exactly the point and perhaps maybe the metric. Because, Father, basically what you said was, you know, if you're thinking about it and there's going to be, or, or, or at least what I heard, correct me if this is not what you said, that in the example of Ezekiel, it's like there will be, you're either going to suffer now by saying it, or you're going to have comfort now, but the suffering will be later. And I think that that's exactly what you're talking about, Andrew, that if it's like me doing this will make me feel better in the moment, whatever the action is yeah. will make me feel better in the moment that's not the action mm-hmm. because that will but that isn't the suffering that's the that isn't I mean, the suffering of our lady that's not that's yeah. not her suffering i mean for, forgive me for being that guy but it's it's just one of those things where i i take very seriously the fact that i don't think there should be such a huge distinction between me as a priest and 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 everyone else do you see what i'm saying so it's not like I need to be super Christian guy and think about the Lord all the time because like that's my job, but everyone else kind of do it when it's convenient. That I don't believe that. You know what I mean? Like I, I don't believe that, right? So all of our all of our calling, all of our vocation, not our occupation, is to bear witness to this world. Like we are Israel. Right. We are we should be doing what is we need to do what Israel didn't do as well as they should have, which is to bear witness to the worship of the Lord God and his love for creation. Right. And sometimes that looks like a strong call to repentance and a warning of judgment. Sometimes that looks like a strong call of repentance, but a promise of a hope and a future. There's, it's always repentance, right? It's always repentance. But the, the kind of like what comes in the wake of that repentance, that's what shifts at times. And we're at a time right now where judgment is, is kind of like the thing, unfortunately. And I think that this reality, no one wants to talk about that. Right for all the various reasons, because no one wants to look like a crazy fundamentalist, nobody wants to look like a televangelist, nobody wants to be ostracized, like all those things. But I think the reality is, is like that's kind of like where we're at, because the 
the struggles that people are facing, right, are so difficult right now because there's still a measure of normalcy <laughs> that, that they are. Do, do you guys understand what I'm saying yeah. right there? That's the weirdest part of it. It's like, is that, is it's a pair. Yeah. There's a, there's this parallel where it's like, everything's not, no, everything's normal. Everything's normal. And it's like, wow, man, things are really, not, they're really not. Nope. 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 It's normal. It's normal. Very strange. Yeah. Yeah. You see it a lot in media. Like every once in a while, I have a TV show where people are, they're just wearing masks, but they're still like, like, continuing about like scripted television where it's like yeah. courtroom dramas but the judge is just wearing like a face shield and like people like in the court have masks on but like the show continues on as normal well saturday night live this last weekend yeah where it was like oh no we have no studio audience nobody's here because of all these cases or whatever but let's just carry on let's not you know not a big deal we pre-recorded all of this but it's fine so like I not, should... not a big deal. And it's like, wait, 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 this is supposed to be with a live studio. Like, no, it's not, right. you know, right. but they well, can just my... go on and people are like, oh, it's fine. No problem. Yeah, totally fine. So on my sign, the end is nigh. I should add a repent at the very top. Repent, yeah. the end is nigh. Yeah. Because it's not enough to tell people then is like, that's one of the beautiful things is there's always something for us to do. Yeah. Getting back to the mother of God, whatever he tells you to do, do it yeah right there's always something put before us that we can do and I, and I just i think that's important because even in this it, it you know one of the things i've never talked about this i've never talked about it in private conversation and if i have with someone forgive me if i'm wrong i just i i remember myself not talking about this because it's bothered me so much and it's just left me unsettled but I'm going to talk about it here for the first time, like here ever. Go. Here we go. The whole silence is violence thing. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I just really, really, really struggled with that. Because it's so antithetical to our tradition and it's a real twisting. Wow. It really is, isn't it? Man. It's, it's, it's a real twisting. And... I think I'm bringing it up right now because the mother of God was silent, but not complicit. And I, and I think that there's a decoupling there that is absolutely necessary for us. And I, I think that whole, that whole mantra was cooked up from the bowels of hell, to be honest with you. <laughs> um, the Lord was like a blameless lamb before, before his shears is dumb, right? I mean, the Lord was silent before Pilate, right? There's, there is this reality of being silent without being complicit. And I'm just bringing that up also in this context too about saying something or not, because there's a time where the absence of words is actually saying something. And I'm not trying to backpedal here but what I'm trying to point to is that I don't want us to ever lose that otherworldly aspect that kind of salt that comes with this um operating in a way that the world doesn't recognize sometimes sometimes when we do something that the in a way that the world doesn't recognize it that's the wake-up call you know there's something about you can say the right words but if you're saying it in the way that the world says it, they won't hear you. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Because it's, it's at the same pitch, tone, and, and, and volume that the world is doing. It just, it all blends in. And so there's- well, so Father, Father, I think there's, the, there's something really interesting here. And it's like, it sounds like there's a contradiction, but I don't think there is. And so I just wanted to like wade in and, and because it just, this struck me because it's been something, this, this has been an ongoing conversation that's been happening in like, or, or in the circle that I'm in. And I think- you know, the two sides of like when, when to speak and when to be silent, like what I, or, or when to, to, to express, express your thoughts about this is what I believe. And at what point is your silence? Like, are you complicit in the thing for me? You know, in that vein, it was like, I'm talking about somebody who is uh, in my circle, friend, whatever, potentially family member, all of these things where I'm having this conversation and they either take it or they don't right? That it's like, here, here it is. It's the watchman, right? Mm -hmm. But 
I'm also seeing now, like I saw a video today and somebody had shared it and it was like, and it goes back to the January 6th thing as well. And, and like the, 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 what did they call him? The Q shaman, which is like, just perfect. Right. Yeah. Like now this dude is locked up, right. It's like American colors, whatever. And, and all of that. And it's like the Q shot, he's just part of, he, he, he was their foil, but I saw this guy in Germany and it's like, okay, this is appropriate. I guess like it's an appropriate, it's uh, whether it's appropriate or not, it's, it's like a predictable response. He's yelling at the cops, calling them fascists mm -hmm. oh, right? in, in German. Did you see that? Yeah. Fascist, I, I fascist. And they arrest him and they arrest him. He's right? not wearing a mask. They're wearing a mask. He's not wearing a mask. They're wearing a mask. And he goes, the cop says, I'm a fascist. I'm a fascist. Says, you're a fascist. Okay. Not wearing a mask. You're under arrest. Right. And it's like, I look at the two, I look at that and it's like, actually, silence would have been more powerful in the case of the guy who's going to yell at the fascists. Mm -hmm. It's like, remove yourself from out of you, remove yourself or stand and like as a wit and bear witness. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. because, because they're not going to be moved. Right. You know, those are the executioners. Right. Like the, the martyr is there and it's like the silence is the. This is the expression like to, to the rest of the people who are watching of like. Of, of your faith. Right. But it's different when speaking to the faithful or speaking to right. people who might potentially be interested in that. It's like in that case. I feel yeah. like then holding back is is wrong. Right. Now, I mean, for me, I, I guess if, if I was to give a general. Um, and not in contrast to what you're saying. It's all, to me, it's all complimentary. And that's, to me, that's one of the things about being a Christian and being Orthodox is that there's this beautiful reality of you have freedom, you have options, but always there's no ambiguity about what's right. If, if that makes sense, it, that it's complimentary. It's paradoxical in that sense. Do you see what I'm saying? Uh -huh. So for me, it's a matter of, you know, again, like I've been teaching the kids in catechism, I'm telling them about when does God's mercy end, right? I think we talked about this before, right? It's like, well, God's mercy ends when your actions, which you have been warned repeatedly over, chastised over, and you, you, cease, to, you cease to desist in these actions, begin to hurt others, right? So, so therefore... God's mercy and patience for you ends because it's now hurting others because he can't, he's not going, he, he can't tolerate the injustice for like against the innocence for the sake of you being, you know, spared, right? So in this same way, I think that if, if someone is, is to say something for the sake of, you know, pulling a John Wayne in the negative way or doing the cowboy thing, whatever. I don't know about that because there's a vanity in there. Yeah. There's a vaingloriousness in there. There's like, there is, there's, there's a type of, you know, um, arrogance in there, right? But if it's for the sake of the love of God, the love of neighbor, you know, these things, like it's out of genuine concern and not for like, again your vanity how you perceive yourself how you want to be perceived i think that's one of the ways you can discern that if that if you if that makes sense what i'm saying you know no, speaking as Total like a sense. ex punk rocker it's been my life dream to stand up and yell at cops like it's just like that's just what i do and like it's i, I like yelling at people that's just the simple truth of it is is i like yelling at people it makes me feel big it makes me feel big and it makes them feel and then it comes down to Elder Thaddeus, that quote that I think I think it made it on the show. But it was like when you are debating with someone, if you have discernment, you'll recognize it's the fallen spirit within them that you're actually arguing with. And when you seek to prove them wrong, that's what that's what creates a hostile environment. And like I've man within this last year, more than any other time in my life, arguably. I have recognized my need to defeat the other person, not, not love, not out of love, not out of like, you know, a sense of wanting to warn them. I want, 
they're walking towards a cliff in my mind they're walking towards a cliff and i'm not telling them to turn around because i care i'm logically pointing out all the ways that they're an idiot for walking to the to the cliff in the first place I'm like what are you even doing over there if you would be smart like me if you believed as i believed you wouldn't even be there in that cliff meanwhile i'm just like got I have one foot already over the cliff and i'm like about to fall down and um that whole notion of being the lone voice that stands up and yells back just so that you can be the lone voice i'm very familiar with that and it's an ugly ugly feeling afterwards because you're like that was total yeah. vainglory that was yeah. total pride and then that's like yeah because that i mean that's the big problem right is correctness is never the thing yeah right it, it's correctness can and most oftentimes does lead to a problem you know it's never it's, the correctness isn't about love you know and so i i think this is important because again whether you know there's um there's there's been a couple of different prayers uh saint philaret has a great prayer um Sophroni has a prayer um Latina elders have have a prayer that these these prayers speak about you know asking the lord to help me keep a spirit of silence if need be or speaking when need be you know asking for that right moment that right thing um and i think it's i think it's real important to to kind of keep that um that context you know because we saw last year that the world wants to corral us one way or the other and we can never let that happen like the Lord always gives us a third option. Like we don't ever have to just be silent or just be one way. And, and again, that's the whole dialectic we talked about. We were talking about last time of this, this, you know, um, thesis, antithesis, you know, to get this synthesis, like they, they're pitting up these two sides and like, you have to be one or the other, but really they're just playing the two sides to get their kind of their outcome. And we have to learn to just sing we're not playing your game period you know what's well, I mean? a very interesting point father because something that i've been thinking about <laughs> i think probably a lot of people have been thinking about it the last probably this last week is and it's been again in conversation like this keeps coming up is that you know those people who were deceived uh for the last year and they did go through with the stuff and they did it all out of fear and now they're being asked to triple down, literally, you know, and many of them going like mm, this time, this time, no, but, and I, my, myself, I have to, to admit, you know, I'm guilty of this as well, that, you know, and, and, and I need my own heart softened in that way is that now where do those people go? You know, like the, the question is like this correctness, like at the correctness becomes correctness becomes where you start hurting other people because of the fact that they're like, oh, well, yeah, I was wrong, but I don't feel those people would never accept me over there. I was wrong. They would never accept me because I, I didn't act correctly. And they've been talking about all this stuff. And so now I can't go to them. So now I just I'll just forget it i'll just go right. in with the I'll, I'll just triple down bingo and and for me god forbid i mean i i can't speak for anyone else but for for my people you know my parish my spiritual children like i don't want any of my spiritual children i don't want any of my people to be like that we should always be a people that if anyone is willing to repent and recognize this error will always accept and 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 comfort and build that build them up you know what I mean? And love them. And, and that's because that's what Christ, would, Christ Christ does. That's what he's done for us, you know? And that's, and that's, that's not the case. There's communities where they, they're just all about being hard in the paint one way or the other. And, and that's not, that's not the way, you know? And so but the, the shame of that such a person, I like to put myself in that person's shoes and, and I've been in right. those shoes, right? Sure. Like sure. it's not hard for me to put myself in the shoes of being wrong because sure. I've been there so many times, right? That it's sure. like, but this is such a big one that the shame is like, yeah. I mean, it would, it, it, 
it takes oh. it takes a, a level of of christian love to be able to help and rehabilitate a, a person and bring them out of that you know i mean forgive me i don't know if it can be done without christian love yeah you know i, don't, I mean because you know how the devil works the, the devil wants to take away all shame to get you to fall into whatever trap he has and then once you've fallen into the trap throws the shame at you to get you to 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 fall into despair like judas you know and and this is the thing about say nikolai i'm pretty sure it's saint nikolai uh Benovich, he, he he has this quote about um uh justice are the flowers on the grave of love i think i think is i think is saint nikolai you know and Instead of saying justice, we can say correctness in this case. Correctness on the flowers on the grave of love. And I think this, this reality of, of being correct to the detriment of love, to the detriment of being able to accept people's repentance and, and, um, and be, be the body of Christ, you know, in a true sense, that's what's needed. And, and, and to be frank, that's what's going to get everybody through everything because, um, you know, I'm sorry to bum out some brothers and maybe some sisters, but like nothing that you're going to do is going to stop what's coming. Mm -hmm. Like you're not, that's Rambo. very clear. That's yeah, very you're, clear you're not, to me. You're, you're not Rambo. Um, I, I don't know as many as some people do, but I've known my share of like gnarly guys, you know, guys who have worked for the government, all that stuff. And um, I guess one of the reasons why I always got along with those guys, the ones that I have known, because they're the type of realists that, that they don't play that BS either. They're like, yeah, <laughs> there's nothing, you know, these, these jokers who think that they're gonna outlast everything. It's like, you're not. Yeah, they go get like a bunker and hide up and stock up. And there's like, yeah. No, no. So, so I mean, that's, that's, that's the thing is that what's going to get everyone through this in a real sense. Cause like, look, okay, great. It's so let's say you survive, you know, holding out against whatever occupational force, government force. Uh, you know, Mad Mag, whatever it is, whatever the thing is that you're prepared yourself for, that's great. I'm, I'm all for it, right? I, you know, great. Um, but like at the end of the day, is you always have to ask yourself, are you going to put in whatever effort you can to the detriment of your soul? At what point do you say, like, you, well, at what point are you going to be okay with becoming just like the ones who you're stopping, trying to stop? You see what I'm saying? And this, this is reality of the, the questioning of the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come and the judgment, speaking of the creed, you know? And so this is a tough one. You know what I mean? It's a tough one. I got a wife. I got daughters. I get that. I got spiritual daughters. You know, I, I, I get that. Um, and, I, and I'm not a pacifist in that sense. But there is just this tension. There's this royal path that we have to keep in front of us. You know, we have to be aware of these things um, and, and we have to be aware of them with, with the eye towards the eternal life and the kingdom of God, you know? And, and I, I think this is really important. I think it's an important discussion and it's not something that there's one size, one answer fits all, but I do think we find, I know that we find answers in the fathers, in the life of the church and in the scriptures that at least put us with a good view of what that world path would look like for us, you know? It's gotta be that. I mean, it has to be the fathers. It has to be the scriptures. Like another thing that's been driven home is like, it can't be up to me. Right. Because like, it can't, because I don't, I'm not smart enough. I don't have that grasp. I don't have, I don't have that discernment. There's like, I jump on every, someone says they're setting up camps next week. I'm, you know, I'm like, oh, okay, 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 okay. And it's like, buddy, there's, you don't, you have like 15 arrows. Like, what are you going to do? Like, there's nothing you can do. Like, you have like, yeah, you're pretty good with a bow and arrow, but like, what are you going to, there's nothing. So then it's like, okay, well, I guess I have to 
look somewhere and it's got to be there. It has to be there. I mean, honestly, forgive me. It's one of those things where it's like, and I'm not even, I don't even mean this in a, in a tongue in cheek way, but just like, okay. Whatever measure of like earthly preparedness you're going to do fine, you know, maybe blessed, but like for every five hours of prepping and whatever you're doing, are you putting an hour in of, of prayer? Are you putting an hour in of reading the saint of the prisons or reading something from Father Roman Braga or, or the or the 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 catacomb churches or those of us, those of, of, of our tradition who have been through these things? Are you actually putting that time into, do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. If you're not doing that, then something's suspect. That, that's all I'm saying. You know what I mean? That's all I'm saying because like that's, it's not like we're heading into something that no one's ever seen before. Exactly. Like, exactly. It, it, you know what I mean? Like <laughs> it, our, our tradition, our tradition, particular, like specifically, has has dealt with this in in recent memory yeah so so it's yeah. not like we need to act like we need to reinvent the wheel like what do you do it's like really clear what to do actually you know mm -hmm. what i mean is there some some leeways and variants one way or the other yeah there's gonna be some people who are gonna be really radical in their pacifism okay great you know and for them to them that's gonna have them be in the royal path and there's going to be some people who they're going to have a conviction to, to take up arms to some degree. And for them, that's the real path. And you can be like, hold on, hold on. Sounds like you're just playing double sides right now. No, I'm not. Because if you read the lives of the saints, you'll see it. You'll see both in the lives of the saints, mm -hmm. right? But the, but the key thing is, is that whatever they were doing, they weren't leaning into their own predilection and their passions. They were, they were doing it out of a, a conviction from God. Either way. Right, whether it was laying down and having their body be made as fodder, or they were taking up arms in the defense of their their loved ones and like whatever, like the light. It's all in the lives of the saints, which is why it's so important for us to see the lives of the saints so we can understand the gospel teachings. But if you're not doing that and you're just being like, yeah, I know of this saint who like slaughtered a million people, like you're just making something up that's not going to cut it, right? Because you never know how any of these things are going to play out, which is why we need to be spiritually prepared, right? We need to be, and, and again, you know, I'm not trying to force the hand here, but this, I, I think about the mother of God and I think about her meditation and, and her knowing from the time of the Lord being presented in the temple, her knowing all those years watching her son grow, watching him change, loving him, seeing him, that he's going to be mocked, humiliated, and lynched, or, you know, put on a cross, basically, the same thing, you know what I'm saying, like that, that's what was coming, right, so she knew what was going to happen, and kept these things in her heart, and, and was not just passive in the sense of a negative way, mm -hmm. right, she yeah. did it because she knew that the work that her son was here to do was, was indivisibly tied to that suffering. And, I and think this, and this, that, and that this is the work that the Lord is doing yeah. like that, that the, that the tribulations that we're going through, that the suffering that's here is the work that the Lord is doing. If we'll listen, yeah. if we'll listen, if we'll listen, if we'll listen. Because there's so many people that, to your point, Andrew, about, about, yeah, it's not just me. Like what, what I do see from people who are, who are not people of faith is, is this ongoing belief. And I don't get it like that, that they're going to do something mm -hmm. or we need to do something to stop this. Like I keep hearing this over and over and over. We need to do something to stop this. But what I don't see any of those people doing or, or they're saying we need to do something to stop this as opposed to we need like <laughs> the thing I need to do is to be preparing myself mm -hmm. for what it what it surely appears is coming. Mm -hmm. And let's say that it doesn't. You're still better. 
yeah. right? Like if you yeah. spiritually prepared yourself, yeah. like right. what better, that's what you should have been doing anyway. That's what you were told to do. That's right. That's what you were told to do, that's you know? Right. And that's right. That's, it's the lack of preparation. That's right. That's right. And that, that lack of preparation, not as an accusation, but I would just challenge people to think of this. If you every once in a while see your lack of, of preparation in this sense as lack of faith, then lack of trust, you know, faith not necessarily knowing doctrine, but faith knowing God, right? And, and trusting in God. I think that can help because this, this lack of preparation spiritually that only really comes if you don't believe in it. If you don't believe it produces any good, mm -hmm. right? People put the time and the money in, in prepping with ammo, with food. Again, I'm not anti that, right? But I'm just saying they do that because they go like, I can feel that bullet and I know someone else will feel it. You know what I mean? This food's gonna fill my, like, I get that. This food will fill my belly, I get that. But then on the other end, are you not spending the time in prayer? Are you not spending the time reading the lives of the saints? Are you not spending the time fasting? Are you not spending the time, you know, really preparing your family? Like, are you not doing those things because, right? Like why, why? Well. The reason why people don't do those things is because they really don't think that they're gonna that they're gonna do anything for them. They don't and, and I hate to say it, but like if you if you hear what I'm saying and if you feel cut, then good. Maybe a challenge to you that you will begin to to put the work in because I guarantee you, right? Um, you know, this this reality of maintaining your soul right not devolving into an animal when you are under pressure when you're under a type of pressure that you've never been under before let's just be clear a lot of the people who may or may not hear this small conversation right we have small viewership whatever but just if you think about on the big picture so many people have never been to jail so many people have never been to a third world country outside of being a tourist. Some people have never really know what it's like to be hungry. Like, do you understand what I'm saying? So it's like a lot of people are in for a big shock when some stuff goes south, right? Um, because they, and not because it's necessarily, God forbid, it's like, like the road or something like that, where it's just complete, you know, cannibals and stuff like that. But I mean, just not living according to the standard of life that you've had your whole life. Mm -hmm. Like we saw, like we're, we see the effects now of what people did when they were in lockdown last year, right? Oh, people dude, the toilet down. papers, toilet paper coming off the shelves and right. all that, like right. that, that was pre-lockdown. That, that was pre-lockdown <laughs> and people were put in lockdown and they had, they had quarantine chocolate, quarantine sex, quarantine TV. You know what I mean? It was like, it, it was like, it was like almost like Barbarella. You know what I mean? People were being tortured with, with pleasure or whatever, but it's just like, okay. They still lost their minds, right? They, they like, if the Lord tarries, God help us the effects that these last two years, I mean, Forget the economy, man. People's mental health. I hate saying that the word. Children. That the children. The children, I father. Mean, oh my gosh. The children. The children. I mean, the children who have who have never I'll tell you what. Seen, who have never what. seen their teachers smile. I, I tell father. you what. I mean, there's there's one girl in particular who I mean, oh my gosh, just like you know, her parents were all were just all into it. And like the two or three times I'd, I'd seen her, just like the fear in this mm -hmm. child's face. It's just like, Lord have mercy. Like, it's crazy, right? It's crazy. And, and, and it's crazy because we're not talking about she lived through Dresden. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Like it, it's it's like whoa, like what people knowingly and willingly 
Let me, let me put that back. Obviously, unknowingly, obviously unwittingly, because if they realized they wouldn't do it, you know, no one wants to, no one wants to submit their, their child to that type of thing. But like, that's what the world has done. You know, well, the but world, they, but something else has been sold. You know, this is this this is the sacrifice to the to the prince of this world. That's right. Is that? I think they willingly know the suffering that they are putting onto their children and the damage that they're doing. I do think that they willingly, I, I do think that they know the potential of that, but I think what's being sold, the deception that's being sold is it's You'll a sacrifice for a greater good. It's yeah. a sacrifice for a greater good. Yeah. yeah. You're a hero. You do it. Safety. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Safety. And I can't pass up a chance to, to bash millennials so i'm gonna do it but yeah this whole notion that father said um it was like she hasn't even she didn't live through dresden like there was no but it seems like at least the minor finger i have on the pulse of the great thought of what's happening now is that like, yeah no we did nobody nobody has known this amount of like this thing has killed more americans than world war one and world war two combined and it's like okay so it's really feeding into this notion of and we've talked about it before and we should probably wrap up so i'll try and keep this short of this victim complex this idea of like look at how much you've suffered look at the things no almost no generation has suffered in the way that you have nobody had there was no riots you know as bad as the george floyd riots on top of like being in the middle of a pandemic like you you boy you guys really are some troopers for staying at home and like watching succession or whatever like you that's guys the voice really... that's the voice of the devouring mother speaking yeah that's no, the voice of the devouring mother right there you're and that's, that's that. her path. but like speaking completely in my own opinion so i could be completely wrong but like that's like a strategy that pedophiles use is this completely catering to every single one of your like your discrepancies i guess maybe is the word all the things that you think are wrong all the all the victim narratives that you want to put on all the victim narratives you want to play out all the ways that people have hurt you just feeding into it yeah yo you did that did happen to you. yeah man yeah that was really bad here let's sit down you know have this drink we'll talk about it for a little bit like it's very serpentine it's very much the serpent yeah yeah it's it yeah. there's this predator aspect to it of like lulling you into a sense of complacency because finally you're being heard yeah. finally someone is like all the things all the all the the all the self-pity that you've always wanted to express is finally finding like a good proper place to sit yeah. and you Which, can continue to unload. By the way, mother of God, no self-pity there. 100%. And that's, that's where. No self-pity there. Yeah. And that's, that's, that was kind of the, um, uh, uh, St. Ignatius, um, <laughs> St. Ignatius Branchinov. I'm reading one of his works right now is um, people who carry their cross without grumbling and who are not angry about carrying their cross are carrying their cross correctly. Mm -hmm. People who are grumbling and who are angry. And that's just like, I couldn't help but think of like the minor crosses that are being asked. It's like, maybe you don't have to I'm just sorry, this is just biting into my my disdain for millennials, but like the minor crosses you're asked to to carry, like, and yeah, those are deadening in their own way, like the the little thousand deaths that you're dying every day uh, because of your complete lack of willingness to be uncomfortable. Yeah, that's all a thing too. But like your um your unwillingness to like work a job that is slightly demeaning or like maybe you don't feel like it doesn't feed your joy yeah but it, let me let me cut you off real quick please do because I, 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 I just want to say i mean we're all in this together in the worst way because the millennials parents were the devouring mother that's what i was about to say they didn't want to i mean that's where the millennials get it from they didn't hatch like that they 
their parents, which I guess that's my generation, right? Like, um, didn't want their their kids to suffer. And I'll tell you something. Let's tell you a story. Um, I was a young father. Um, I had only one. I I, I don't. I, I think maybe my second was born at this point in time, maybe. So I was a young father and obviously a very inexperienced father. Um, and I remember being in my shop uh, one afternoon, I can remember it like it's just happened yesterday. And a, a guy I'm talking with and um, we got on to the discussion of kids and um, I was saying to him, as, as I often do, I was, I was drawing parallels between um, my life experience and, and in this case, being a parent and my, my, my understanding as an artist, right? And I brought up discipline and the need for discipline, both in children and in artistry. And this guy, right, who was, who was my junior by quite a few years, he says, I mean, he gets, he's offended. The, let me tell you, okay, this is 2001, right? Just to give you some insight. He, he's offended and he says, you discipline your children? And I go, and I, I mean, my, I remember my being like, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Like, you can't make this stuff up. I go, what, what? I couldn't believe, like, what? <laughs> what would you say? He's like, you discipline your children? Are you serious? I was like, and I said, no, no. Do you know what discipline means, man? Like, do you, he's like, oh, I know what that means. How dare you? Like, that's, he didn't say like, he didn't say barbaric, but he said something to that, to that effect. And I was like, no, man, I don't think you understand how I mean discipline, whatever. So, I remember just having to say, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go, you know? And I think I got someone else to like take care of him or whatever, like another tattoo artist, whatever. I'll never forget that day because I, it's a lot like when my dad told me the Simpsons were going to ruin the room, going to ruin society. That's one of those moments where I was like, I saw something happening. If you understand what I'm saying, like this guy who to this day, I still don't understand where that comes from, but he was offended that I disciplined my children and, and would not hear anything of it, right? That was the first of my ability or, or, or from, from my experience of seeing that spirit begin to peek its head in, in, in the world. Mm -hmm. It's a demonic utopian spirit. It's the spirit. Dude, it it's was- the spirit of the woke. It was, it was like, again, this like 2001, whatever demonic i remember mm -hmm. coming home and, and talking to my wife about it she just kind of like you know and and it's i say that because you know for us you know we are a kind of a unique family whatever because our external appearance you know kind of tricks people i guess they just you know she has dreads and tattoos and i'm tattooed and so they just think that i don't know we're smoking weed with the babies or something <laughs> like i don't know what they think we do right but when people find out that we're conservative you know and all that stuff and have been the whole time right that we're christians and all that stuff and you know and i don't mean rush limbaugh conservative i mean like you know christian whatever yeah. like they people lose they're like what you know but but the thing is is like that spirit I, I, that's my first time seeing it. And it's, it's something that I've recognized my whole life of being a parent at this point, because I've seen it pop its head in other areas as well, but that's where it came from. It, it was this unwillingness to, again, not, not follow the, not emulate and follow the example of the mother of God by allowing the necessary sufferings to happen, right? that's how the millennials got where they're at, right? And so in that sense, it's, it's really, you know, to take on an orthodox perspective on it in a kind of Dostoevskyan way, I have to repent of that, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? 
being that's my generation who just refused to do the hard work of being a mother and a father to their children and, and watching them have the suffering now for the long-term benefit of being healthy, strong human beings, if that makes sense, you know? You're, you're, you're totally right, but we can't tell millennials that because then they'll just find another person to blame. And it's somehow still not their fault. It's still, it's their crappy parents and all this. Well, well let me, let me go there again. and their crappy parents. Yes, let me go there again, though, because I think, it, I think in this way, though. I just really don't like millennials. I'm sorry. I, you know, but, they, but this thing is it manifests, it manifests to us what we need to see. They show us the thing that we need to see. Yeah. Like, okay. You know, and, and again, I'm just playing the kind of like advocate in that sense, but I, I just, I don't know. It's, I have, I have to hold something out because that reality of, again, the problem isn't that the, the problem isn't what the millennials see. The problem is, is how they've been habituated and, and kind of nurtured into going about dealing with it or, or lack thereof. Yes. I, you know what I mean? It's not like the things that they see aren't, aren't the case. It's just that the spinelessness and the, just all the stuff that kind of comes with it. That's, that's the problem. Well, as you had said before that I thought was incredibly profound, it's not their fault, but it's their responsibility. That's right. It's yeah. not your fault. That's your responsibility. Still your responsibility. That's right. Whether or not, you know, that's right. I think it's, it's a deep, deeply profound message deeply profound we're i think we're coming up on it too andrew yeah I, again i just had to say i don't like millennials I'm just <laughs> we've heard, heard been, i'm pretty this hard has on been them. heard Be the curmudgeon today <laughs> the, there are very few things i'm persistently sore about but the state of my generation is one of them and that it's just every day i just am i'm filled with it's something i'm working on but it's, it's just uh, the state of things, the language of things, the way that people talk. It's, uh, it gets me to a point, and this is me just being fully honest, it gets me to a point where sometimes I no longer see them as human. It's just like, it's just mm -hmm. like well, a- Don't get to that point. That's what I'm saying. It's a problem. It's like, I, it, there's some- I, su I suffer from that too. There's some deeper from that going too. on. And it, it's probably tied to, that was me you know, maybe two years ago, not to that extent. Yeah, I was never a communist. That's right. That's right. Yeah. It was you. It was you. I wasn't a communist. I'll say that. And I wasn't like capitalism is the, the root of all evils and all this stuff. And if we were just overthrow it, everything would be perfect. And we can all just do whatever we wanted all the time. I, I wasn't quite there yet. I was on the way. I wasn't quite there yet. But no, a lot of it is I spot it because I got it. And I know exactly where they're coming from. And I know the easy traps to fall into of self-pity. And, you know, that was me. That was me after my first spiritual awakening and just being like, you know what? Like that guy in seventh grade, he was a jerk. And just like, that was, you know, that was the rest of my week was just sitting well, there. What you are seeing is something inhuman. What yes. you're seeing is inhuman. I think that that's important. Yeah, like you're you're seeing them as not human, but what you're seeing is not them. You're seeing the inhuman thing that's taken root. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you remember what Elder Thaddeus said? It's not mm -hmm. them that you're I know. In arguing with, right? And it's not mm -hmm. against flesh and blood, principalities mm -hmm. and power, spiritual wickedness in the heavenly places. It's always that. Yeah, mm -hmm. and you can tell again, and we'll wrap up after this. But you can tell again, it's that same thing. I think we talked about is when you hear those phrases it's like i had a buddy and i was i love this guy dearly and we were talking i've he's changed his mind since then he's talking about we just need to get rid of the rich the rich of the problem he's eat like the rich eat the rich and and then communism and i was like and i was like okay let's wait for it i was like okay well you know every time that communism has been implanted it, it's been a disaster like that wasn't real communism andrew Real communism exactly. has never been tried. Exactly. That's he what he said, said right? <laughs> and then I was like, and then I, I was in the Walmart parking lot right by the house. <laughs> by the way, this guy's espousing communism while we're walking into Walmart. So Walmart. good job, buddy. Good job. And like, um, 
he and then I was just like, I just remember parking and being like, you've been listening to a podcast or you've been reading this on Facebook. Like Mm -hmm. you, the arguments that you're saying right now, they're not your arguments. Those are other people's words coming out of your mouth. And I know it because this is the same argument I hear every single time from everybody who's espousing communism. But there's, but this is at least one thing is that the one thing about your generation is they're searching. And I think that one of the reasons why this whole woke thing has taken hold and why this has taken hold is because it's such a spiritually like receptive generation. Mm. You know, they're very spiritually receptive. It's not like a materialist generation like mine. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, it's not at all like about that. People in their 40s, bro. Oh, so materialistic. Mm -hmm. Like the worst, dude. Mm -hmm. 20 somethings don't care don't care about material things like so much of their life is digital like which is already like getting close to the spiritual right like if they've got a million they'd rather have a million followers than a million dollars in the bank you know yeah so it's so it's like they're so close and that's the reason why the adversary is able to get such a grip is because they're already they're just these big spiritual receptors who are like Ah, oh, this world is not so good, great anyway. Metaverse, that, metaverse, metaverse time. Metaverse. Right? So, oh, so, man. so this is. But this is the thing: is that that might it might be the generation that ends up pulling this thing out because this is the generation that if if I'm just saying, Lord works in mysterious ways, we man. Know. Like we can. You know. The, my closing comment is, is that as far as that discernment of when to be a soldier and when to be a pacifist, you know, he's a great example of that is it old Captain America. <laughs> that man is not afraid to kill. That man is not afraid to kill when he absolutely needs That's to true. throw a Nazi. He will throw a Nazi or two off a big building. But there are so many times where he he lays the shield down and says, no, I'm not going to do this. So, um, yeah, I feel like this wouldn't be this podcast if I didn't throw that in there. So I agree. There are much better examples, but he's not a bad one. Um, so speaking of the nineties, um, you 40 somethings, uh, who is your favorite X man? Ooh, I know mine. Mine's nightcrawler. Nightcrawler without a doubt. He's my good. Nightcrawler is a priest, too. Yeah. Oh, uh, you know, you know who mine is? Gambit. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know what? <laughs> you bring in totally a Gambit guy. <laughs> totally fine. You're totally a Gambit. <laughs> totally, one hundred percent, man. <laughs> You're totally a Gambit guy. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. I think I know fathers, and it's pretty obvious. But Gambit's not bad. He's fine. I just, he's never. He's awesome. He's not my he's guy. Awesome. He's awesome. I feel, I see the thing that I like about Gambit is I feel like Gambit is that he's, he's always on the outside. Mm-hmm. Like even more so than Logan. Mm-hmm. Like Gambit's always on the outside, but I feel like his, he's, he's, he's like, he's also like straight. Like he's got a, a code of a, a moral code. He's not going to break. It's a little, you know, I don't know that he's royal path. I think that he makes, a, you know, he makes some mistakes. He's definitely a sinner. That's for sure. Well, him but and you know what, married, that's for sure. Yeah. Well, you know what you're going to get with Gambit. That's the thing. Every single time, one dimensional character, but I like his one dimension. I got to say that. No, there's like nothing that wrong with that. Yeah. Captain America beats him up, by the way. And Avengers versus X-Men, Captain America beats up. Yeah, he's, I mean, he doesn't have any, like, he's got that staff or whatever. He doesn't really have he's any, got and he's, staff. <laughs> and he's, what, he's got to keep everybody far away from him. He's, he's just got to throw bars. cards at him. <laughs> Man. <laughs> Maybe Gambit's way cooler than I realized. He's super cool. I could tell you who the worst X-Man is, though. Hmm. Who do you think I'm going to say? Storm. Psych- Storm. Storm. Okay. Really? She's the That's worst. Interesting. Why? Why? She's weak. She's out of the fight instantly, every time. Every time. That's like a that's like a golden handcuff thing. 
it's like when you every go- time it's like why are you even here like you get a little tornado started and then boom knocked out like what are we doing why are- <laughs> but it's like watching those old she just Jeff- looks good she just flies in looking good and then bam just knocked out <laughs> it's like that golden handcuffs thing though because it, like in the old uh bruce tim justice league stuff what happens to superman every single time that's true that's true knocked out because they that's can't true. have him in the fight because he's that's too true. powerful same that's with true. the flash theoretically nobody should ever be able to beat the flash but they have that's to true. knock him out they have to slow him down they have to knock him out storm theoretically like she could do some she's, I, theoretically she's the most powerful of, of yeah all. i mean i would say this the other thing about storm is she led the x-men for a long time when she had her powers taken from her Mm, and this interesting is she, she had her she had her powers taken from her she fought cyclops to to be the lead of the x-men beat cyclops without powers and an awesome mohawk yeah the mohawk. i remember that i remember yeah. that, yeah. that was black cool. panther she marries t'challa yeah really yeah. i didn't yeah. know oh, yeah. that that wrinkle yeah. i didn't know storms? that storms so she so her, her powers actually made her worse because she was too powerful, maybe. Yeah, well, that's actually a thing because that whole arc of her losing her powers, that was about her actually discovering her true like strength. Mm. Right? And, that, and she was able to be Cyclops, you know? So there's something to that. So the addendum to the question is who's your favorite and who's your least favorite X-Men? Okay. So the- so who's so you guys have you guys gone yet? Who's no, your favorite? father, you should go because I gotta think of my least favorite X-Men. So it's tough because, to be honest, like I've always loved Wolverine. Who doesn't love Wolverine? Sure. Um, but I think, I think I might be conflating who I identify the most versus versus who's my favorite. If that makes mm. sense, you know. Um, because I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's because we were just talking about it not too long ago tonight or whatever. But it's like I I used to really have a disdain for him but in the last couple of years just i don't know there's there's just something in my heart about cyclops no he's cool and i love cyclops i mean there's just there's something in my heart about cyclops and just like there's something about the guy who tries to do everything right mm-hmm. and is just called a chump for it there's mm-hmm. something about the guy who's like i just cyclops is meek he bears he, it, man. He just really bears it. He really bears it, and he's always holding yeah. back. Yeah. You know what I mean? For the sake of what he thinks is, like, right. And even when he's wrong, he's just, he's still a man who's trying to pursue, who, mm-hmm. who's a man, he's a man of principle. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, I don't know. There's something about Cyclops, like, I really, it really resonates. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, but I think... I think my least favorite X Men. I'm gonna. I have to go kind of obscure. Is there's a guy named Forge? Oh, Ooh, I don't know. I don't know for. I don't remember. Yeah. Which is cool though. So, okay. So, so Forge was this Native American dude who was like his mutant powers, like the ability to do stuff with like machines and stuff he like that. Build oh, I do remember this yeah, guy. He build anything, whatever. But like. He was just one of those like bleh, like characters mm-hmm. that was there, and and he even had like this weird thing with Storm. Speaking of Storm, and there was this whole kind of like I wasn't really sure because it was it was one of the first arcs I read when I was a kid. Like one of my favorite artists, Barry Windsor Smith, did the art for this arc. And it was about the the loss of Storm's powers because she lost her powers because of him. Like he created a weapon that was able to take oh. the powers. So there's this whole kind of Judas thing where like she was loving the dude who took her powers away. And there was like a whole, and I just remember reading and thinking to myself, I'm kind of like, this is funny. I'm like, I know I'm emotionally not smart enough or mature enough to understand what I'm reading here. Mm. Like, do you know what I'm saying? Like there's something Mm. here that like, I'm not getting. And Mm. it it made me uncomfortable, like in, in a bad way. Not, not in a weird, like, someone touched me away, but just, like, I don't, th- like, looking back on it now, there's a complexity of that arc with that love story that, like, bothered me. I didn't understand it. It was, 
it was too much. You know, you know yeah. what I mean? And so I associate him with, with that, mm. right? It, it mm. was kind of like starting to dip out of the innocence of like, this is just a great superhero story. And like, you know, I can connect with some of the characters at a certain level and getting to some human complexity that like. X-Men gets deep sometimes, man. Some of those story deep. arcs get deep, man. Yeah. Fam- familial things and all yeah. kinds of where yeah. you're just like yeah. oh, the emotional yeah. the emotional depth on some of those arcs is really and this was one serious. of them this was yeah. really one of them for me because I and just that's why I don't I don't like Forge I've never liked like I don't like him I don't like the way he looks I don't like his power I don't like this weird thing that he had with Storm <laughs> like loving your abuser just I, I don't like that it just it makes me feel bad yeah <laughs> to speak to Forge in the video game X-Men Legends to uh, Age of Apocalypse or Rise of Apocalypse or something like that. Forge is not even a playable character. Forge is like the dude you go to to like get your armor repaired and stuff yeah. like that. So like that's the heat that Forge is bringing. I mean, like, he's not even like a or lack thereof or lack yeah, thereof. Exactly. You like go see him when you need something. Then you go out and do cool stuff. He's always like hanging out at base camp, like just like that's fixing funny. stuff. So what's uh, yours, Andrew? Favorite and least favorite? Favorite's Nightcrawler. My least favorite oh, has yep. to be either Cable or Deadpool. Both of them pretty much suck. Yeah, I don't like either one of them. Because, and Father and I were talking about this earlier, they're both creations of Mr. Rob Liefeld. And every uh, the one of the main reasons why I struggle with X-Men in the first place is because of Rob Liefeld. On top of the fact that Deadpool has ended up being a somewhat okay character, somewhat, but he yeah. is, we're in that whole thing about God introduced death as a way of, uh, of uh, combating sin. Deadpool doesn't have that. That's Deadpool right. can't die. That's so right. he is hedonistic in every regard. He is can't canonically pansexual um mm-hmm. and uh extremely murderous and silly about it um that's fine i get that there's a humorous aspect to that one written well that's funny there's you know it's it's not like i'm like well he's killing people that's you know no there's there are times where people are ra- able to write that well but then there are also times where he's just there's no motivation for growth there's no change mm. happening with this character he's forever stagnant and you can maybe argument all comic book characters are but deadpool is especially so um and then for cable cable is everything that is wrong with 90s x-men comics his origin is time travel based with alternate realities and clones of like already existing characters it's so unbelievably convoluted I cannot even to this day after whatever time spent trying to figure out having something to do with Jean Grey's clone, if it's from like an alternate future being sent into the past, but like he didn't get sent into the past. Ah, ah, Exactly. It's It's a headache. So if I'm not clearly understanding what the origin of the character is, if I'm not really understanding what his motivations are for doing the things that he does, why do I care? Like, why I mean, is he even in the story? Because why even spend any time on it? To draw somebody with gigantic muscles, right? A gritting mouth like that, and with right. huge neck and pouches and guns everywhere. And so he came up with Cable. Theoretically, I should like that character. Right. He's like a got like a he's telekinetic and fighting like a robotic or a machine virus all the time in his body. It's, it's cool motivations, but like mm-hmm. I've never seen an X Men. I've never seen a story which has ever made me care about that character and mm. man i deadpool if if there is salvific aspects of comic books which i absolutely agree that there there are in my own opinion there is nothing salvific or redemptive really about deadpool like there's mm. nothing there's nothing the movies are different the movies are different there are good parts of those movies yeah where kudos to you ryan reynolds for making me care about that character for those two mm-hmm. movies because normally i would not i could not care less but those are actually pretty gosh darn good movies so aspects of them anyway so mm. that's my answer so good i like those 
Um, so anyway, we mentioned this last time. I think we're putting together a Q&A episode. Um, so please send in questions to the landing page, uh, royalpath.network. Um, and uh, I think that's it. I feel like there was something else, but I don't or know. Or they can put them in the comments of the YouTube if they want to. There you go. Or they can well, put them on, send, send them on Twitter to me on Twitter if they want. Twitter. Some people are Absolutely. listening like that. Excellent. We'll take them. However they come, we'll take them. We'll log them in. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll put together and all that kind of stuff and we'll we'll do what we can. And then also we'll link that uh Priest Monk Cosmos, his mm -hmm. um his page on the vaccine or on the little thing, the little thing, the jab. The little devils, the little devils. Little devils. Send, send me send me the exact link you want to so yeah, the devouring mother way. talk that you did, Supreme. And and yeah. I'll link the devouring mother talk for sure. Yeah. Yep. Those are all gonna be below. If you're watching on YouTube, they'll be below. Okay. Yeah. Coolio. All right. Thank you guys. Have a good night. Thanks, guys. Right. Bye.